Well, good morning. And this morning I want to ask this question really. I wonder what you're waiting for. Maybe there is something really significant, something really important that you're waiting for. Perhaps you're waiting like uh, uh, for a house move. Perhaps you're waiting for some hospital test results, which are really key. Perhaps you're waiting for the next stage of life. Perhaps you're waiting for furlough to end so you get back into the workplace. Or waiting for a job, trying to put in job applications. Or maybe you're waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright to come along. Or perhaps you're waiting to become debt free. Or, or maybe something completely different. You know, there's so many things which are really important to us that I'm sure many of us at this time are waiting for. And of course we're all waiting and it doesn't appear like it's gonna be very quickly for lockdown and the effects of coronavirus and COVID-19 to, to pass o over us and to, to be gone. And so we're in a season of waiting. And so it's really appropriate that we spend this time thinking about what God has to say to us in these waiting times. And so no better person to look at than Joseph. And Joseph, of course, is the one who's famous for his technicolored dream coat, or as the New Living Translation calls it, his beautiful robe. And uh, Joseph had a God-given dream, how his brothers, uh, he shared it with his brothers and he had his bundle of grain and his brothers had their bundles of grain, their bundles of grain all fell, gathered around him and bowed down. And then he had another dream, how the sun, the moon and 11 stars all came and bowed before him. And of course his brothers got it straight away. They, 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 they saw that he was saying, essentially, look, I'm gonna be a leader over you. I'm gonna be in charge. In fact, they said, you're gonna, be, you're gonna reign over us. What do you think? This is ridiculous. You're the youngest brother. Younger brothers do not rule over the older brothers, especially in that culture. But of course we know the end of the story. 13 years later, that is exactly what happened. His brothers and his father and mother all came and bowed before Joseph. So there's some key things we can pull out of this story for ourselves, which are really helpful for us. And so there's three things particularly this morning I want us to, to focus on, which are important for us, especially if we're in a season of waiting. And so first of all, what is, first one is this, if God is, uh, has given you a, a, a dream, if you have a God-given dream, you don't have to force it. If you have a God-given dream, you don't have to force it. You know, if, if you have a sense that God's leading you to become a, a fantastic musician, um, go for it. But that also means, when I say that, hear me properly, you don't have to, don't be lazy. You know, you want, don't, don't sort of go, oh, well, God, I don't have to force this. God's going to make me this amazing musician. That's okay. I don't need to practice. No, that'd be ridiculous. That'd be stupid. You would never become a brilliant musician if you don't practice. God's given you the energy and the skills you practice. We have to hone up our skills that he gives us. But what it does mean is that we don't have to beat ourselves up if an opportunity to achieve our goal or our dream seems to pass us by. And sometimes we think, oh, well, if only I'd tick this box on the form, if only I'd said these, that, was, that phrase in the interview, if only I'd have put this forward, or got someone else to do my reference, or all these kind of things, and we can start beating ourselves up. No, no, you know, if, if God's in it, you, you, it'll happen. You don't have to force it. You don't have to use manipulation. You know, God will open up the way. I mean, you've got to look at the life of Joseph, someone who uh, became a slave and then was thrown into prison. That's not the CV for becoming number two in the world's greatest superpower of its day. <laughs> that does not happen. But God made it happen. And so if God is in your dream, you won't have to force it. Now, of course, there's a myth I want to debunk here because um, there's a, a thing going around today which often is said, and you see it particularly by athletes when they've achieved some kind of goal. They often come on television and say, it just shows that, you know, if you have a dream, anyone's got a dream out there, and if you work hard enough and you follow your goal and follow your dream, you will achieve whatever you want. Well, that actually is not true. You know, in any race, only one person can win the prize, yet hundreds, if not thousands, of people are striving towards it. So it's not true that anyone can do that. Some people can, but only not, every, not everyone. But what is true is that you can become all that God wants you and God made you to be. 
And that's what you should aim for. But then the second thing is this. Remember, God's timing is always perfect. God's timing is always perfect. His timing is not our timing. We want it quick. We want it instant. We want it now. And God often says, wait. Wait. And that's perhaps one of the hardest words to accept. But God's timing is perfect. And we can see this in the life of Joseph. You know, Joseph was able to be in just the right place at just the right time to step into that key leadership position which saved thousands of people from starvation because God had got him in the right place and given him the right experiences. And it started way back at home in the family where Joseph was sent off to... um, see what his brothers were up to and to bring back reports to his father and it's clear when you just read the text in Genesis 37 in the early part there you can see that Joseph was looking at what his brothers were doing and not impressed by some of it. He could see how ways they could have improved things, the way they actually weren't very diligent at times and clearly he reported this back to his father which didn't make him popular with his brothers but it It showed a mind of someone who would become a great administrator and overseer and leader because they could see through the flannel and they weren't trying to garner popularity for themselves. They wanted the job to be done well and to the best. And Joseph was starting to that process as as a youngster in the home. And then, of course, then when he went and was sold as a slave by his brothers, you know, he didn't just sit there, and I'm sure he, he must have had days when he just thought, what on earth has happened? How did I get here? But he didn't stay in that place. You know, clearly he, he then decided to become the best he could there for God. And he was able to rise and become a slave that in Potiphar's house, a key household, he was the person who oversaw the household. It says that actually Potiphar didn't concern himself with anything. His boss didn't concern himself with anything except for what he ate. (laughs) And he knew that Joseph would have it under control. Joseph was an organiser, a born organiser. But then, that was just one household, but then God gave him a wider experience where he went from there to actually a prison. And again, you wouldn't expect that to be a, a training ground, but actually he rose up become, essentially to become the manager of the prison. And prisons, we know from British experience, are not easy places to run and to organise. But essentially, he was running that prison. And so by the age of 30, 13 years later, after he had his God-given dream, he was good to go. He had the experience, he had the training, he had the energy of being still young enough to suddenly take on this new challenging position to enable... Uh, the nation of Egypt and the nations around them to have enough food to feed during a famine. And so God's timing was perfect. But then lastly, while you wait, make it your aim to please God. While you wait, make it your aim to please God. You see, when Joseph was there as a slave, Potiphar's wife you know, he could have been easily forgiven for saying, well, you know, I'm here in this place. It wasn't my fault. I got shoved it here as a slave. My brother sold me. It's, it's pretty bad luck for me to be here. No one else is knowing what's going on. I'm just going to enjoy the perks that go with the situation. You know, this is just one of the perks of the job. And uh, it is, his master's wife asks him to sleep with her. It would be bad, you know, bad form for him to refuse because she's, she's the boss, surely. No. When he was tempted by Potiphar's wife to, to sleep with her, he said these words in Genesis 39 verse 9, How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against who? God. A great sin against God. You see, he knew who was watching his life even when no one else saw. He knew who he was living for. He was living for an audience of one, for God. And he made it his aim to please God. God and so should you and so should I and centuries later the Apostle Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9 
as he was talking about how our bodies are getting uh, our human bodies become frail and weak and we groan and we feel frustrated and they they deteriorate as we get older but yet at the same time we're followers of jesus if we're christians we're looking ahead to that new body that new heavenly body which will be ours when we pass from this scene into the next and he said that uh, while we're in that waiting process in verse back end of nine nine he says this that we're to make it our goal our goal is to please him our goal is to please jesus our goal is to please god and so let me encourage you you know i don't know where you're at in your stage of life maybe for some of you you're waiting for significant things well if god's in your dream you don't need to force it remember god's timing is always perfect so just be content to wait but in that waiting time while you wait, make it your goal to please God. You know, my life has had a number of significant periods of waiting, and these have always involved years, not days or weeks. I know about 20 years ago, I was inspired by studying these very same uh, passages from uh, the life of Joseph, and seeing how Joseph had that God-given dream, it got me thinking, what was my God-given dream? And all my life at that stage I've been mean, lived wanting and dreaming to become the best far farmer that I could be so that I could just serve the Lord out of that situation and that was okay that was good I enjoyed it but I realized that actually God was starting to call me into a new direction away from my focus being on farming to actually to be someone who was uh, serving as, as, as a, a pastor of a church in the kind of place, position I serve now, but also someone who encourages other church leaders and other would-be uh, pastors to, to consider starting and planting other churches. And it actually took about five years when I felt that first sense of calling from God to actually moving forward. And that wasn't because I was um, disobedient to him, it was because there was a process I had to go through. All sorts of things which I, I hadn't many of them I had no control over but it just took time but I can see looking back how actually God's timing was perfect in that you know uh, as we moved into being involved in Cinderford because I had no knowledge of hardly anyone in Cinderford at the time how people came out of the woodwork who in themselves in their lives in their spiritual journey were just at that right place where they were wanting to connect with God and we could just see how God was bringing us together and that was quite exciting and encouraging to see so there were so many things that i thought were not that important but actually they were they were, in, they were part of god's training for me because every waiting period if you're in a waiting period it wouldn't is not wasted god is doing something which you can't see probably but in that process in that time frame make it your goal to please him